What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. But, Mr. Sweet, that sort of thing is entirely out of my line. Yes, I suppose it is, Mr. Carter, but after all, you are our official investigator. All right, all right. I'll have one of my men take care of it. Now, tell me again what you want me to do. One of our clients is being sued as a result of an automobile accident in which a woman was very severely injured. Our client got the name of one witness, but another witness got away before he could find out who he was. Now, our client says he was a very tall, thin chap with red hair, probably in his late 20s. A bystander told him that he thought this man lived just a couple of blocks away. That's all we know about him. But his testimony is extremely important to us in our defense of the case. We must find him at once. All right, Mr. Sweet, we'll find him. Where was the collision? Corner of Boylston Avenue and second place on the north side. And this red-haired young man lives a couple of blocks from there in some unknown direction? That's what we believe, Mr. Carter. All right, all right. I'll send Mr. McGlynn out at once. Thank you. As soon as we have something definite, I'll let you know. began a case the like of which had never been encountered by Nick Carter, Master Detective. A search for a missing witness seemed like a simple routine job, but Nick didn't know about the two old ladies who lived in the little house on the edge of town. You'll learn all about it in The Case of the Little Old Ladies. You say you don't know nobody was right here? No, I don't. I'm trying. Of all the jobs for a great detective like me, going from door to door looking for a guy who probably don't even exist. I never knew Nick to fall for such a dumb stunt before, and he had to wish it on me. I don't know why I don't quit. Forty-seven houses I've been to. Nobody ever seen a guy like I'm looking for. But I heard about every kind of fellow but the kind I want. If yes? I could... Who is it, please? Good morning, I wonder if you can tell me anything about a tall, thin young man about 26, 28 years old with red hair. Well, now, let me see. I know almost everybody in this neighborhood. We've lived here a great many years. Hmm. If you'll come in, I'll ask my sister if she recalls such a person. Oh, now, ma'am, I don't want to put you to no trouble. No trouble at all. We'll be glad to help you if we can. Do come in, please. Well, all right. Of course, I want to find this fellow, so if you can help... Of course you do. Edith? Yes? Will you come here a minute, dear? What is it, Mary? Can I... Oh, Edith, this is Mr. Uh, Mr. Waldo McGlynn, ma'am. Uh, Chief Assistant to Nick Carter. <laughs> Mr. McGlynn. Uh, how do you do, Mr. McGlynn? How are you, ma'am? Mr. McGlynn says he's looking for a tall, thin young man with red hair, about 26 or 28 years old. Do we know such a man? Well, now let me see. Uh, there was James Bond. He used to live down the block next to Moshe's. Oh. But he moved away last year. Oh. His hair was really almost blonde, dear. Do you suppose he could mean Walter Castle? Oh, sister, he must be nearer 35. I suppose you're right, Edith. Uh, how about young Ed Terrence? He lives over on the next street. Oh, no, sister, he's short. Almost as short as Cousin Elmer is. Mm. So he is. Oh, look, ladies, it's awful good of you to take all this trouble just to help me find this young man, but I don't no, want to... trouble at all, Mr. McGlynn. We just don't seem to be able to do it. Mary, uh, maybe Mr. McGlynn would like a cigar while he's waiting. Of course, I'll get him one. They're in the box on the table behind him. Oh, no, but... don't get up, Mr. McGlynn. I'll get it for you. <laughs> I, I hate to have you doing all this for me, ladies. If you will just... Mr. McGlynn, don't move. Just sit where you are. What in the name this of... This is a gun you feel on the back of your neck, and 
if you don't stay very quiet, it'll go off. Well, and I... you'll never find this young man you're not looking for. Not looking for? Uh, shall I tie him up now, Mary? Yes, Edith. Tie him up right in his chair so he won't have to move at all. Oh. And tight enough so he can't move. <laughs> very well, Mary. I brought the rope as we planned. Oh, but look, look here, ladies. I just want to find a fellow. You who... can't fool us, Mr. McGlynn. We know why you're here. You came here to try to trap us into a confession. But we were too smart for you. Now that you've found out where we live, we'll have to go away, of course. That's why we have to tie you up so you can't follow us. Oh, Mary, Bill isn't going to like this. He trusted us, and now look what has happened. We've failed him. I know it. I can't imagine how this man found out, but I'm afraid Bill will never forgive us, sister. What in the name of all the holy are you dames talking about? You know well enough, Mr. McGlynn. You don't have to ask us what we've done. If you didn't know, why are you here? There, now, there. He can't get out of that, I'm sure. Oh, look, ladies. Nick Carter ain't going to like this. Not at all. He says I always get things balled up, and now he... Oh, don't he... you worry, Mr. McGlynn. He can't blame you. We're just too clever for you and your Mr. Carter. Uh, come, sister, we must pack and... Uh, is it that all good thieves say, oh, yes, we must pack and scram. There you are, Waldo, free as a bird. Oh, thanks, Cubby Boy. Oh, can't move. I'm as stiff as a board. Ah, oh, you'll be all right in a minute or two. <laughs> Now, listen, Waldo. You say these two old ladies tied you up so as to give them time to move out? Yeah, that's what they said, Nick. They thought I had the goods on them for something I didn't know nothing about. Well, couldn't you guess what that something was from what they said? Yeah, not a single guess could I give, Nick. But they was altogether too cagey for me. Oh. One of them said something about thieves, but that was all. Oh, by the way, Nick, I forgot to ask you, how did you happen to find me here? That was easy. Patsy told us what route you were planning to follow, and we followed you. Oh. You had called at the house on the left, but you never got to the one on the right. This house being empty, it was a good bet that you were here. Nick unlocked the door, and here you were, waiting for us. Waiting for you? And what else could I be doing but wait? <laughs> oh, you and your bum jokes. Now, listen, brother, you listen. There's something going on here that's bigger than a lost witness, and I'm going to find out what it is. But what can we do, Nick? Waldo doesn't know what it's all about, and the old ladies have gone. So what do we have to go on? Nothing. We've got to find something. And the best place to start looking is right here in this house. So search every room thoroughly. Don't miss a thing. I'll get busy, both of you. And all you found was that burned paper? That's all, Patsy. Uh, and what good that is, I'm darned if I can see. When a piece of paper is burned as bad as that was, so you can't even see if it had writing on it or not, I give up. Oh, that's where science comes in, Waldo. Uh, if science can tell Nick what was on that paper, I'll take my hat off to it. Even old Sim Carter couldn't do that. The use of infrared light and reading the writing on a burned paper is one of the new developments that have oh, come in. Oh, Nick, to... did you find anything worthwhile? Maybe yes and maybe no. Fortunately, that burned paper we found on the ashtray was a good grade of paper and didn't crumble before I could look it over. Well, what'd you find, Nick? That piece of paper was really two separate pieces of paper. One was a wrapper off a bundle of bills, showing that the package was put up by the First Mutual Bank on Canal Street and had contained $100, probably in small bills. The other was part of a letter. Oh, what did it say? All I could make out was, another month, dear aunts, it'll be safe to use the money. So we, and that's all. <laughs> that's a lot of help, that is. Fancy, do we have any record of the first mutual bank being robbed in the last year or so? Oh, I I'll see, Nick. The money this wrapper was on obviously came straight from the bank. No, nothing on the first mutual at all. But the records show there was a payroll robbery about six months ago hmm. in which the payroll messenger was robbed of $153,000 that came from that bank. What was the firm that was robbed? It was the Brownson Industrial Corporation just across the river. You know that big plant on Market Street? All right. 
Let's call on the Brownson Industrial Corporation. I'm going to see this thing through to the end. You want to see me, mister? I do. You're the payroll messenger who was robbed about six months ago? Who are you? This is Nick Carter. Tell him what you know about it. Oh, okay, yeah. The guards that came with me from the bank left me at the side door of the office building as usual, and I came along inside. There's a short corridor there, about ten feet long, with a turn at the end, leads into the general office. Well, I was just coming to the turn when a couple of old ladies stopped me and... Later, Walter, later. You say two old ladies? Yeah. This couple of old ladies stopped me and asked me how to get to the metal shop. I stopped to tell them when all of a sudden I got a sock on the back of the head. Knocked me cold. Then what happened? How do I know? I was out cold. And when I came to, the assistant cashier was bending over me, trying to wake me up. My money bag was cut open. The money was gone, every nickel of it. Did anyone else see these two old ladies around? Yeah, yeah, the gate man who let them in. They said they was coming to see their nephew, Walter Bascom, a clerk in the office here. So he let them go by without waiting for an okay. But Bascom never saw him. He says he ain't even got an aunt. And he didn't leave his desk all afternoon. Were they seen after the robbery? Oh, they was out of the gate before the alarm was give out. The gate man saw them go. Can you describe them? Well, they looked like a couple of sweet little old ladies. Maybe like your pet grandmother. One was short and chubby. The other was about middle-sized, kind of kind of slender-like. The same, Nick. The very same. You're sure of that, Walter? There couldn't be no mistake, Nick. Look, you didn't find any clues as to who slugged you. No suspects at all? Nah, not a one. But it must have been somebody who works in here. Couldn't have happened like it did no other way. Uh, okay, thanks. Well, so long. Well, Nick, looks as if this is as far as we go. No, Matty, there's just one more chance. Huh? I have the photograph I made of the piece of burned letter we found at the old lady's place. Yeah? If the writer was the thief, it seems very probable. And if he does work here, as that messenger seemed to think... We might compare the writing on the letter with samples of the writing of the employees in the plant. Oh, but, Nick, that would take forever. There are several thousand employees here. Uh, yeah, them two dames would die of old age before we got that job done, like as not. Nick. Yes, Waldo? I just happened to remember. When them two old dames was tying me up, they kept talking about somebody named Bill. Huh? Uh, you sure of that? Sure, I'm sure. They said this Bill was going to be pretty sore at them for getting found out. Oh, Nick, this makes the search for the thief a whole lot easier. Why, sure. We just look at the handwriting of every guy in the plant named William. There may be a lot of them, but it'll be a whole lot easier than checking up on everybody who works here. Well, Waldo, it looks as if you remember that name just in time. Come on. The personnel manager ought to be able to dig up a specimen of this bill's handwriting for us. Uh, much as I regret to say it, it isn't this William either. You mean to say that out of 347 guys named William who signed these employment cards the personnel manager gave us, there ain't one that writes like the sample in the photograph? To the trained eye, there's not one of them that's the same. <sighs> Oh, Nick, that means the whole theory that an employee stole the money is out the window. Yeah, that leaves us exactly nowhere. Nick, maybe the guy's name ain't William at all. Uh, Bill could stand for some other name. Why, of course, Walter, that's the answer. It must be. His name was Wilbur or Wilford. Well, come on, uh, let's get busy. We only have a few hundred more names to look through. Is it all right? Who is you it, sure? Wilfred Bergen. Works in the stock room. Mr. Brown, where's the stock room? I'd like to talk to this Bergen. Uh, it's in the next building, back of this one. You'll probably find him at his desk. It's just to the right of the door. Uh, would you like to have me call him and tell him you want to see him? No, thanks. We don't want to warn him we're coming. We don't want him to get away before we have a talk with him. job sure was a neat setup. This Bergen watches the messenger, sees how he goes through this little corridor every time he comes back with the payroll, tells the old dames that they're what they're to do, and it all works out just as slick as grease. Yes, the old lady stopped him in the right place, and Bergen socked him. And they shielded him while he cut open the money bag. 
And they calmly went home, taking their money with them, probably in one of those shopping bags women carry. And Bergen went back to work, and that was that. Yeah, and they're waiting until the money cools off so they can spend it. Uh-huh. I wonder where they hid it while they're waiting. I hope Bergen will answer that for us. There he is, Nick. Uh-oh. Yes. You, Wilfred Bergen? That's right. Bergen, this is Nick Carter. He wants to ask you a few questions. Questions? About what? Bergen? Where did you hide the money you got from the payroll robbery six months ago? Why, I... I don't know what you're talking about. No? I think you're Jew. You and your aunts knocked out the messenger and stole the payroll amounting to $153,000. Now, what did you do with it? You're crazy. I had nothing to do with that. Better come clean, Bergen. We got you dead to rights. You think you can make me confess something I didn't do? You're nuts. Bergen? Is this your employment card? Yes, it is. What about it? Does this photograph show part of a letter you wrote to your aunts recently? Let me see it. Hey, come back here. Stop or I'll shoot. I think he's falling down the stairs. Go on, maybe he isn't hurt bad. You won't die, Bergen. You only got shot in the leg. My neck. My neck. I can't move. Let me see. Huh? Huh. You shot him in the leg, all right, Matty. But in falling downstairs, he broke his neck. Oh, oh Nick, no. Smooth. Now, Bergen, see here. I'm afraid you haven't long to live. Before you go, tell me. Where's the money? Uh, isn't there something we can do for him? Uh, I'm afraid not, Fancy. Bergen, where did you hide the money? Uh, I buried it. Where? Where you'll never find it. You might as well tell us where you buried it, Bergen. We can get your ranch to tell. They'll, they'll never tell you. I did it alone. Find it if you can. I stole it. If I can't have it, no one... Is he gone, Nick? Yes, Matty. He's dead. And the secret of where he hid the money died with him. Well, look, I ain't giving up yet. If he buried it like he said, it's probably buried somewhere around that house where his aunts live. Now, I'm going to have a gang start digging there bright and early tomorrow morning. Good luck to you, Matty. I'll drop in on you later to see how you make out. Hello, Sergeant. Having fun? Hi, Matty. How are you making out? As if I couldn't see for myself. <laughs> oh, I ain't making out, Nick. We've been over this whole doggone lot and not a sign of the money. Well, apparently Bergen must have buried it outside the limits of the property. Well, if he did, he can stay there for all of me. Do you realize, Nick, that this is the last street in this section? From here out, it's open country. And the darn stuff could be buried anywhere for the next five miles. Matty, if I can tell you right where to dig for the money, will you try it once more? Nick Carter, you've been holding out on me again, so help no, me. No, 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 I haven't been holding out on you. Just answer my question. Yeah, I'll try it once more. But look, if it don't work, keep away from me next time I see you. Okay, Matty, meet me here in the morning about 10 o'clock. I may have something for you. So long. So long, Sergeant. Uh, Nick, hmm? you really have an idea? I do. I believe I can come back here tonight and locate the exact spot for him. Well, well, tell me, Nick, what's your plan? I'm going to get hold of an army officer I know and have him help me. Help you what? Locate the money. Is that all you're going to tell me? That's all for now. I like to surprise you, Patsy. Oh, someday you'll tell me something and I'll surprise you. I'll probably drop dead at your feet. Sorry, this is such a blind search, Lieutenant, but as I said, we have no idea where the money was buried. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Carter. I'm used to working like this. Not too dark for you, is it? Oh, no, indeed. I've worked this gadget on darker nights than this and got results. I suppose we swing over this way for a change. We pretty well covered the ground on that side. Okay, Mr. Carter, whatever you say. Over here, maybe? Yes. If we don't find anything in this trip, I'm afraid we'll... Hey, wait a minute. You found something? I think so. Yes. Yes, this is it, I'm sure. No question about it? None at all. I'm certain that if you dig here, you'll find the money. Well, if the money's there, Matty will find it. But we don't want your Matty to find it. Who are you? We want to find it ourselves. Of course we do. The money belongs to us. Now. Why, of course. 
Yeah, the two old ladies who tied Waldo up and left him in the house the other night. Well, what brings you back here now? The money, of course. I mean, how did you know we were out here? We didn't, but we read in the late evening paper last night that the killing of our nephew Bill had solved the payroll robbery and that the case was closed. And so we said that it would be perfectly safe to come back here and get our money. And when we did, we found you here. We've been watching you for a long time from behind the trees. Oh, yes. And now that you're here, how do you propose to go about digging it up? Oh, I'm sure we can persuade you to do that for us, Mr. Carter. Oh, really? What makes you think so? This? Hey! They got a gun, Mr. Carter. We have two guns. One for each of us. And we both know how to shoot very straight. Our dear departed father taught us when we were girls. Now, look, ladies, you better let me have those guns. Uh, Somebody might get hurt. Nobody's going to get hurt, Mr. Carter, if you start digging. Now, look here. A joke's a joke. This is getting too... Mr. Carter, put your hands up over your head. Oh. You two soldier, you put your hands up. What do we do, Mr. Carter? We don't do anything. We just... Hey! That went right past my ear. Are you putting your hands above your head now, Mr. Carter? Well, see here, this is all very silly. I guess we better do it. I'd rather be silly than dead. That's very wise of you. Okay, okay, my hands are up. You'd better see if either of them is carrying a pistol, sister. I read in a book that that's always the first thing to do in such cases. Oh, my... Excuse me, please. The soldier doesn't have one. Oh? Oh, look, Edith. Mr. Carter has two pistols. Oh. Aren't they beautiful? Oh, put them over by that stump, Mary, where they'll be safe. Now, will you start digging, Mr. Carter? I can't. I haven't a shovel. I'll get you one. I remember seeing one in the cellar of our house. It isn't a very good one, but you can use it. You wait right there. I'll be back. He'll wait for you, sister. Won't you, Mr. Carter? It looks that way. But now look here. It's no good. The police will be here before I can possibly get the hole deep enough to find the money. It's three o'clock already. Oh, then I'm afraid that will mean you'll have to hurry, Mr. Carter. We must have the money before the police come back. So you'd better take your coat off and get ready to dig real fast. Look, sister, the soldier has gone to sleep. Yes, poor dear. He must be all worn out watching Mr. Carter work. Oh, what time is it? 7.30. Oh, dear, I do hope we can find the money before the police arrive. Uh, Mr. Carter? Yes? Please dig a little faster. It's getting late. Oh, hold on. That's it, all right. Well, at least I have the satisfaction of knowing we found the right place. Hmm. Well, after ten. Matter you ought to be here by now. Are you two still up there? Yes, we are, so don't stop digging. We must get that box before the police arrive. I don't have to dig anymore. I found it. You found it? Sister, just a week up. Mr. Carter's found the money for us. Isn't he nice? He found it. Oh, what a lovely man he is. Uh, Soldier. Soldier. Yes, yes. Uh, Will you help Mr. Carter get the box out of the hole, please? You mean he's found it? Yes, yes, I found it. Oh, here it is. Can you reach it? Just a little higher. Yeah, that's it. I've got it. My, that isn't a very big box to hold all that money, is it? Why, I believe I could carry that myself. Of course we can. Here, soldier, I'll take it. Here you are. Thank you. Now, please jump down into the hole with Mr. Carter. What? Do what? Jump into the hole with Mr. Carter. It's big enough to hold you both. And I think we'll be gone by the time you get out. The hole is over eight feet deep. You better do as she says, Lieutenant. You know how loudly that gun of hers can speak. Okay. Watch out. How do you do? Oh, thank you both very much. Yes, thank you so much. 
I hope we meet again sometime. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I hope this story never gets around. Nick Carter and a lieutenant in the U.S. Engineers made prisoner by two little old ladies. And two little old guns. You can't forget those. Well, come on, let's get out of here. Give me a boost, will you? Yeah. And I'll haul you out. I rather think they won't get very far. Oh, I'm so glad we found this money before those hotted policemen got here. Oh, yes. We can go in the house and wrap it up so no one will know what it is. Yes. Then we can go back to our old home and live comfortably for the rest of our days. Yes, dear. Oh, watch out for that first step. Uh, that'll be far enough, ladies. <gasps> Stand right where you are. But where, where did you come from? Watch out for the Matty. They're dangerous, I know. What, what do you want with us, officer? I want you and I want that box of money you got there. Well, and don't try reaching for your guns. It won't be healthy for you. Oh, look, Sergeant, there comes Nick and that army man. What? Oh, dear, they must have gotten out of the hole. You, you mean Nick and the other guy was in the hole where that box was? Yes. We hoped they wouldn't get out till after we'd gone. That nice Mr. Carter dug the money up for us all by himself. Nick dug it up? Well, I never... Hey, hey, Matty, have you got the money? Yeah, the money and the dames both, and they won't get away from me, I can tell you. Well, I gotta say one thing for old Sim Carter... He never let a couple of old dames get him in a hole. <laughs> he knew how to handle women, he did. Uh, what happened to all your science, Nick? The science was on their side this time, in the form of a couple of guns. And they could shoot them, too, believe me. <laughs> now, you, you both stopped razzing Nick. He did the best he could, didn't you, Nick? Yes, Patsy, I did the best I could. I stalled around with the digging until time for Matty to show up. Of course, if they hadn't been two old ladies, I could have... Yeah, them. sure, sure, we know. If they hadn't been so weak, you could have overpowered them both, single hand. Hey, Nick, tell me, how'd you ever find where that money was buried? Patsy said you were using some kind of a trick device. Well, just a mine detector, Waldo, same as they use in the war to find hidden mines. Oh. The detector can find hidden metal even when it's buried as deep as this box was. How deep was it, Nick? Eight feet. And if you don't believe me, look at these blisters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Nick, look. See that chap standing there watching us? Certainly I see him. What about him? Red hair, tall, thin. Must live in this neighborhood or he wouldn't be standing there kibitzing. Isn't that the witness Waldo started out to find? Oh, you're right, Patsy. And as Maddie has the thieves and the money and we have our witness, we can consider the case closed. Except for these blisters of mine. <laughs> Nick boy, your old father used to say, never be ashamed of honest toil. Remember that, Nick. Never be ashamed of honest toil, even if you do happen to be doing it at the point of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Nick, how about a few highlights on next week's show just to whet our appetite? Good idea, Ken. My story next week is about a man who was killed by a rifle shot, but the bullet came from the wrong gun. And the ladder was too long. The which was what? The ladder was too long. So what? That's the story, together with the fact that the boys' club met very late that night. That's enough. That's enough. What do you call this weird combination of clues? I call it the case of the wrong clue. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In The Return of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places, is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This is the mutual.